Um, it is my pleasure to introduce the ever deadly and ever vibrant Tommy Mayberry. Tommy is the manager outreach and recruitment at St. Jerome's University. Previous to this role, they were an educational developer at the University of Guelph. Our educational developer team met Tommy on a dark and stormy day at the University of Victoria during the 2018 Educational Developers Caucus Conference. And as you know, Victoria is often stormy. But from the very beginning, I realized that Tommy was keen to learn about Indigenous ways of knowing, being, and doing, which dominated much of our early conversations. Since then, Tommy has taught me a lot about queer perspectives, pronoun usage, trans pedagogy, and inclusive teaching. Tommy is as approachable as he is kind in sharing his knowledge. To quote Robin Wall Kimmer, a Powhatawami nation citizen, botanist, professor, and author, reciprocity is a matter of keeping the gift in motion through self-perpetuating cycles of giving and receiving. Tommy's gift of teaching and learning is this reciprocity in motion, and they are always learning and striving for equity, diversity, and inclusion in higher education, both in their work and relationships with faculty and students. Tommy shows us all that the academy is a place for everyone to learn, to grow, and to use their imaginations. Finally, in the words of one of the world's greatest queens, RuPaul, when you become the image of your own imagination, it's the most powerful thing you could ever do. So please help to give me a, a warm UV welcome to Tommy Mayberry. Thank you so much, Jen. And good morning, everyone. Um, I was only really half listening to you, Jen, because I, I can't cry with, with any of this on right now, and I don't have a box of Kleenex near me right now. So, um, but thank you for that very kind opening. Um, that was wonderful. Um, well, thank you all so much for coming um, to the Center for Teaching and Learning's Online Teaching Institute. I am so happy to be here virtually with you. Um, I wish I were there physically. Um, I, I did my makeup in a wonky way this morning where I kept checking how it looked on Zoom and in the mirror because the lighting was different across them. So I, I was very much aware of um, some of the, the digital technologies this morning as I was getting ready. Um, and thank you for coming to my, my talk this morning, which is Gender Pronouns, Teaching and Learning and Cultures of Respect. I want to start off by sharing this photo of um, Westmount Rose Trailer Park in Ontario, um, Canada, and this is the Grand River. Um, any of you who had listened to the podcast interview, you heard me talk about growing up in Elmira, Ontario, and Westmount Rose was just a 10 minute drive from there. And this trailer park, a family campground, is something that my parents have um, camped at not my entire life, but almost my entire life. Um, and I grew up playing in the water um, on the river here. You can see that that little bit of turf there was always sort of where we would enter and, and go in. And I wanna start by sharing this today um, to, to acknowledge the land that I'm currently sitting on um, here in Ontario. I know we're all tuning in from different lands as well. And normally I would like to learn more about the land that I'm visiting. And I'd like to speak about being a visitor on land, um, but I am still sitting on the land that is the traditional territory of the, um, the Atawandran and neutral, um, the Anishinaabe and the Haudenosaunee peoples. And when I was growing up playing in this river, my entire life, this land felt like it was mine. Um, it felt like, you know, this river was mine, that covered bridge in the background. If anyone's seen the Stephen King It movies, that was featured in it. Um, I've always felt this really special connection here. And it wasn't until I started um, in grad school and I started learning, as Jen had said in her intro, about Indigenous ways of knowing and feeling brave enough to ask Jen um, to help me understand more about how to do a territorial acknowledgement properly and appropriately. I think I even asked Jen how to do it right. Um, and she said, there's no right way to do it, um, there, but there are personal ways to do it. And when I learned that um, the traditional territory where the University of Waterloo is located, where St. Jerome's University is located, where I grew up playing on the river, um, something that comes up in the, the standard territorial acknowledgement kind of copy and paste text is that um, in 1784, Frederick Haldeman promised the land to the Six Nations that includes six miles on either side of the Grand River. Um, and hearing that it was six miles on either side of the Grand River, this river that I thought was mine, that I, I played in, that I grew up on, that I felt such a connection to, and knowing that of those 90, 
or 950,000 acres that only about 4,800 um, or 48,000 of them, excuse me, are still indigenous territories today. Um, really made me think about the land differently. And um, it made me think about the power of feeling ownership. It made me feel about the power of um, understanding history and, and the land. Um, and it really made me think, which is, which is how I want to um, acknowledge the territory today as we start, it really made me think about the power of unlearning. Um, and the way that I grew up playing in this river, learning about the history of the Grand River, um, and never learning, um, never being taught actually whose land this was and where that treaty from, you know, almost 300 years ago came from. Um, so I wanted to share this picture that um, means a lot to me in a lot of different ways. And as I continue in my work, um, keeps meaning different things in different ways, but please keep that concept of unlearning in your minds with me as we go forward today. All right, so. Outcomes, as Jen said, in a, in a former life, I was an educational developer, and you know how we love our outcomes. So by the end of this keynote, we should all be able to define and discuss pronouns, including gender pronouns, as parts of speech in English language discourse, history and culture, um, history and culture with a knowledgeable, inclusive and respectful vocabulary. We also should be able to identify and implement strategies and resources for positive engagement with gender pronouns in teaching. And we should be able to use pronoun awareness to signal cultures of, ref of respect and to reflect on whiteness, marginalization, trauma, and continued struggle. So I want to start us off by thinking about what is a pronoun? Thinking about the English language pieces of it. Um, and don't worry, there won't be a grammar test at the end of this, although this is the kind of lesson I'm going to be taking us through as a grammar lesson. Because as Dean Spade says, and Dean Spade is a, a transgender lawyer and scholar in the States, Dean Spade says that a pronoun is a somewhat obscure grammar term after all. Um, it is, at its core, a part of speech that replaces a noun, and nouns are a person, place, thing, idea, or emotion, so that it can stand in for that noun in discourse and communication. So you've probably seen, and you were probably hoping you would never have to see again a table like this, but this is a pronoun table. There are subject pronouns, he, she, they, it, those pronouns that would follow a verb. He sits, she sits, they sit. There are object pronouns, him, her, them, it. Those are the ones where, you know, um, the bottle belonged to him. And possessive pronouns, his, her, or hers, their, and theirs, or it's. You know, it, um, the water bottle was his, his water bottle. So pronouns as a part of speech, and you'll remember there are eight parts of speech, like nouns, verbs, prepositions, interjections. I'm not gonna go through all those. We're doing pronouns today. Um, but this is what a pronoun is. And they fit into these three cases. So when we think about what a gender pronoun is then, this maybe wasn't something that was covered in our grammar school lessons, um, or it was touched on, but it was taught in a way where, you know, as our kind of key theme here is gonna be unlearning needs to come in. Because when a pronoun replaces and stands in for a noun who is a person, we are grammatically responsible for aligning the pronoun standing in with that person's gender. So our language itself does dictate this. So a pronoun by definition, coming from Robert Lowe's A Short Introduction to English Grammar, with critical notes from 1762, says that a pronoun is a word standing instead of a noun as its substitute or representative. And in the case of the pronoun are to be considered the person number, gender, and case. And so what's really interesting about this one, and the reason why, for those of you who are thinking, that is quite an old definition to go back to in 1762. Um, well, there's a couple reasons for that. One of the reasons is that our language as English is um, quite an old language, even though it's a relatively new language, and we've had these rules, a short introduction to English grammar, for hundreds of years. Um, the other one is I like to tell a fun sort of anecdote around who Robert Loth is. If we were physically together, I'd actually ask someone if they know who Robert Loth is, but I'm not going to try to navigate that. I couldn't even figure out sharing my screen this morning, so bear with me. Um, but Robert Loth was a bishop of the Catholic Church in the 1700s, and he wrote the short introduction to English grammar with critical notes as a way of categorizing and cleaning up and tidying up the language. Um, he's the one we have to thank for inventing the rule that it is, in, it is incorrect grammatically to end a sentence with a preposition. 
And it's in this book that we get that rule. And I'm sure many of us throughout the years and probably still do, especially in marking our students' writing, will see a preposition at the end of the sentence and think, oh, you can't do that. You can't end a sentence with a preposition. Well, we have a Catholic bishop to thank for that. It's also important, and you'll see another note later when we talk about British history as well, um, and where we come from, that we inherit this legacy in our language, this colonial legacy, this policing, this patriarchal, this Catholic legacy in our language. So I want us to keep that in mind as well, that it was a Catholic bishop who said that there is gender in the pronoun, and that we are responsible for considering that when we talk about it as well. So here's our table again. And when we're thinking about applying these um, pronouns to replace a noun who is a person, there's one note that we need to bring up and that's that we won't use it when we're referring to a person. Um, never, we would use it to refer to a person. Um, it as a pronoun is incredibly dehumanizing and we're seeing that taken up in political discourse across social media, across presidential campaigns, where groups of people who are not wanted, are not desired, are not considered human are being referred to as it as a pronoun. Um, just anticipating a question that may come up, um, I one day may put an asterisk next to this because um, some people um, do use as their pronoun, the pronoun it. Um, so if somebody tells you that that is their pronoun, um, that's the one that you should use. Another common theme for our talk today is going to be, however somebody asked you to refer to them, that's how you refer to them. Um, that's part of the cultures of respect piece we'll get to. But um, in my work, I have found that I have met with a little bit of challenge from some folks when I have said not it, never it in italics. So imagine a little asterisk there for it. Um, but I want to um, spend another moment just thinking about why we wouldn't use as a default it to refer to a person, um, because that's what happens, that dehumanizing um, piece happens when you misgender a person as well. When you use a pronoun that is not their pronoun, that's not one that they feel connected to, that's not one that they used to feel respected, it has the same rhetorical power as referring to a person as it. Um, so there are several layers to that, that as well. So we've talked about what a pronoun is, we've talked about what a gender pronoun is, and then there's a really important question which breeds a series of follow-up questions of tension that we get. And that question is, but isn't they plural? And so thinking about what Robert Loth said around gender, case, and number, if we're gonna be using a kind of Catholic colonizing um, description of, of grammar for that, isn't they plural? And so I think it's interesting. So Jen Mannion, who is a prof in the States who um, is a leader in um, gender studies and queer studies, notes that she argues endless battles with well-educated people who think their own grammar school lessons from 40 or 50 years ago preclude them from referring to, to individual students as they. Dean Spade says that this year, which was 2018, my students are working to advocate that our writing faculty stop teaching that the singular pronoun they, them is grammatically incorrect, a battle we still have to fight even though the mainstream press has recognized this use. And think about the mainstream press, they, as a singular non-binary pronoun, was named Word of the Year in 2015. What we also want to think about as we're thinking about um, these pieces here and thinking about teaching and learning specifically is again that note of unlearning. So thinking about grammar school lessons from 40 or 50 years ago or thinking about writing faculty who are teaching that the singular pronoun they, them is grammatically incorrect that they is a plural, that it represents multiple number, numbers for that, when the mainstream press has recognized and celebrated that um, it is actually a singular non-binary pronoun. So the follow-up question that I often get is, okay, but isn't they plural in academic cultures? So we get that kind of addition around, sure, that's fine, but academic cultures, they is still plural, right? It was for a long time. In 2017, the Chicago Manual Style CSM um, updated to add that they is a generic third person singular pronoun used to refer to a person whose gender is unknown or irrelevant to the context. In 2019, Merriam-Webster's Dictionary updated to define they as a singular indefinite pronoun used to refer to an unknown or unspecified person, to a single person whose gender is intentionally not revealed, and or to a single person whose gender identity is non-binary. And just this year, before the pandemic, um, but still 2020, we see that date and we think everything's the pandemic. It was before, 
But the APA, the American Psychological Association, and the MLA, the Modern Language Association, also added the singular they. The MLA also includes themselves as a reflective pronoun. And this is quite exciting to think about themselves as a reflect as a reflexive pronoun that we can actually use in our academic writing because we haven't, that is not technically, um, and it wasn't technically a word, you would use as the reflexive pronoun themselves, even when referring to a single person. Um, now, however, the MLA says that themselves is acceptable. Um, and that's really exciting because that makes my argument about a um, precedent in our English language that allows us to refer to single people with plural pronouns and verbs um, a little bit easier because the second person, you, in English, also does what, they, what we're working to have they do. So in, in the second person case with you, we conjugate it plurally, you are. We don't conjugate it to say you is. But we can refer to one single person in the second person and say you are eating an apple. And we don't have a, a problem. We don't think that that is, you know, radically um, against any of our freedom of expression or free speech. We just are aware that you are eating an apple. And if there is more than one person who's eating that apple, you are eating the apple. Um, and what our language did before with, um, with the reflexive pronoun is we had yourselves and yourself as reflexive pronouns that we could use to um, identify if it was a single person or um, a collective of people. And now we can do that with they as well. Um, so it's interesting when you get all these arguments around, but isn't they plural, um, but isn't you plural? Well, it's both. We conjugate it the same way. We understand based on context, intonation, tone, um, other descriptors in the sentence, other sort of performative utterances or um, other pieces around us what, what is happening for that. But um, something about the, the gender, I think, of the, the binary pronouns he and she are what maybe get people up in arms. So fine, people say, but the, the singular they is at least new, right? and then parentheses, desperately, right? Like it's new. It's not something that has always been here. Well, it's remarkable that it took until 2015, the word of the year, um, and beyond for academic culture, for this pronoun to gain the considerable traction that it has, since as early as our Middle English of the 1300s, before our language even looked or sounded the way that it looks that we're speaking today, our language had this in its, in its employ. So here's the Bible. You know, that might be helpful sometimes to quote the Bible. I hear that's helpful to make arguments. Um, I won't read this in Middle English. My, um, one of my thesis supervisors who's a Middle English um, scholar would not appreciate my, um, <laughs> my, length or my pronunciation here. Um, but this is each one in their craft is wise. So each one, singular, in their craft is wise. There's the Bible from 1382 using a singular they, they, there. And here's Oliver Goldsmith's The History of England in 1771, just about a decade after Robert Lowe's um, grammar and The History of England, um, a piece of colonizing history um, that has got us to the sort of nation states that we now are, um, writes in 1771, Every person who had been punished for seditious libels during the foregoing administration now recovered their liberty and had damages given to them upon those who had decreed their punishment. So three instances here of a singular they referring to every single individual person who had been punished under the previous laws. What you don't see the Bible doing and what you don't see Oliver Goldsmith doing in this incredibly important text from 1771 is doing he slash she you actually even don't see them doing just he. Another story for another time is that um, Adam in the book of Genesis is also referred to with a singular they. Um, so that's exciting to think about a non-binary first man as well, but um, that's a different talk for a different time. Um, so we're at the point then with the gender prone or with the, the English language specifically thinking through, it's not new, it's not singular, and we understand that we are responsible grammatically for aligning it. So thinking about the second person and how we do that without um, problem, we probably don't need these parentheses of the right, right? To be specifically trying to cling on to that. So when we add a layer on then thinking about what are gender pronouns that people use, because they isn't gendered the way that he and she as binary pronouns are gendered, 
When we talk about people's personal pronouns and their gender pronouns, we can helpfully think of them in series as well as cases. So that table that I had showed you before, we can add a column that's the series. So it can be easier to think of them as the he series of pronouns, which would include he, him, and his. It can be helpful to think of the she series, the they series, but some other gender pronouns that people use might be the Z series, which would be Z here and here's, or the V series, V, them, ver. Some people as well will use what I call the just my name series, which would be the subject pronoun would be the person's name, the object pronoun would be the person's name, and the possessive pronoun would be the person's name plus apostrophe S for that. I want to clock as well that this table is neither exhaustive nor complete. Um, these are just um, some of the more um, known or more in use um, pronouns that people use past the they as a, as a non-binary um, pronoun or a singular pronoun. And a couple notes as well. Some people do use gender neutral pronoun series that might be unfamiliar. So this for many of us might be the first time we've heard of the Z series or the V series. Some people also just prefer to be referred to by their name and not by the use of a pronoun series. Side note, that is not anyone's place to say to a person, but that's just really bulky in language to say Tommy set Tommy's water bottle down so Tommy could take a drink when Tommy was thirsty. If that's how the person is saying that's the way to respectfully refer to me, you don't question it. You refer to them that way. And even in academic writing, um, there are other ways that we can write than having to use that many substitutes across a sentence. Um, however, I love hearing my name. If somebody said my name four times in a sentence, I'd be like, yes, thank you. Say it more. Um, and some people are also are open to and do use um, more than one series of pronouns. And so I'm an example of that. So I'm going to share um, a lot of personal information with you folks right now um, because I, I have a story that I like to tell um, that kind of chronologically follows, chronologically and alphabetically follows my pronoun series, um, which are he, she, and they. Um, so please do use any of those series of pronouns to refer respectfully to me. My name is Tommy Mayberry and I was assigned male at birth. Um, I actually, um, funnily enough, was assigned male before birth. My parents didn't want to know the sex of any of their um, children, but at an early ultrasound meeting, the doctor let slip some male sounding genital words. And my parents both were like, oh, that sounds specific. Um, so they knew that when I was going to be born, the doctor was going to assign me as male. Um, so I'm the only one of my three siblings who actually was named before I was born as well. Um, so there are a lot of stories I hear about little Tommy in my mom's womb when, when, um, when she was pregnant with me. Um, I visually present most often in a culturally coded male way. Um, I'm very thankful for the time difference from Ontario to Alberta that I didn't have to start getting ready at six o'clock um, your time. I started getting ready at eight o'clock your time, or sorry, eight o'clock my time. Um, but I've been to conferences and I've, I've taught in drag other times where I haven't had that much time. So I have gotten up quite early before the sun to get ready. Um, but in most of my day-to-day -day life, I do visually present in a culturally coded male way. I also have a same sex partner who's also named Tommy, if we're just wanting to add more, um, more confusion, more layers to that. And we do appear as a, a gay male couple as well, um, who people wonderfully call the Tommies. Um, I'm an academic drag queen. Um, so as a drag queen, I'm somebody who um, performs um, part of my lived identity in a gendered way, um, in a visual way. Um, I have only ever lip synced to a song once in my life, and I, I'm not going to post that all over the place because it wasn't very successful. Um, but I am somebody who teaches in drag, conferences in drag. Um, my work comes from such an embodied perspective that for me, um, I'm a drag queen because I'm an academic and as an academic, I'm a drag queen. Um, in the LGBTQIA2S plus banner, um, three of those letters resonate with my identity, um, gay, trans, and queer. Um, whether I'm in or out of drag, I always have my nails done. My hair, as you can tell in, in my, my pictures there, including the, the, the really young one on the left, my hair is always done and I, I, my makeup is always on fleek as well. Um, that picture is one that I didn't know was my earliest or first time doing drag, but I was seven years old and um, my mom, we found this picture when my grandmother passed away at the beginning of 2020 going through all the old photos and um, this was the youngest that I had seen myself in drag. And I asked my mom, like, what was I supposed to be? She's like, you just wanted to be a lady. 
for Halloween. So um, this is maybe more mum's interpretation visually of what a lady is with the curlers and the wig and the the smock with the, the heels on them. Um, but my mom was the first person to put me in drag. Um, and that's the photo that um, I now have and now know of the first time I started doing drag. I, I should have changed the slide to actually put vibrant because that seems to be the word that is floating around um, from CTL about me. But um, flamboyant and fierce are adjectives I've used to describe myself. Um, and I use they when I refer to myself in the third person because for, for most of my life, um, I understood that the way my body looked would have people assume a masculine um, binary pronoun he, and that always felt right to me. Um, but when I started doing drag and I started learning more about myself and, and I recognized who this person was in the mirror, um, and I now know from that picture on the, on the left there, um, that's why I recognized myself. What was plenty of times throughout my childhood, my mom had put me in drag and, and it was something that I was interested in and something I was wanting to explore. So the first time I did it consciously for an academic um, English language metaphor project in grad school, um, when I looked in the mirror, I recognized who I was. And as I started doing more research into this kind of embodied cognition, autoethnography kind of work, um, I really came to feel connected to the, the she series of pronouns. And when I started publishing academically and editors were asking for um, bios and they wanted them in the third person, I didn't like the way he slash she looked. And I felt that it robbed me of who I was to only use one pronoun series. Um, so I used they to refer to me um, to encompass every part of who I am. And when I share my pronouns, I share all three series because any of those series are... Um, are who, are who I am. Um, although I, I will say that if people refer to me with the he series when I'm in drag, that feels a little wrong. Um, that feels a little bit like I spent all this time, I spent all this creativity, I look incredible, um, now is the time to use she. There will also be times when folks who um, have met me or who are really close to me or have met me for the first time in drag um, will use she sometimes unconsciously because a lot of their connections with me, a lot of their interconnections with me as well, um, that automatic kind of embodiment for them comes out in the she pronoun. But that is not a little, that is a lot about me. Um, I like to do this in my talks and in my teaching and in my work um, because it can be really challenging sometimes to use case studies of other people or of celebrities, um, especially those who are still alive and living and you know you may build up in a, in a certain way for your students. Um, but I do like to add the caveat here as well that um, I am not a synecdoche of the queer community, of the trans community, of the drag community. Um, I have shared a lot of personal information with you and a lot of information that most people might even have been uncomfortable hearing in an academic talk to come through for that. Um, I chose to do that. Um, I would have chosen to do that if I was there with you physically um, as well, but you know, I'm at home right now, which is an even more safe space. Um, but it is not okay to expect every queer or trans person or every drag queen um, to share their stories as part of your teaching or as part of your unlearning. Um, and not everybody is going to have had the same journey or be understanding of who and how their bodies are in the same way that I am. So, um, I will absolutely be more than happy to answer questions. So yes, please do understand um, and please do empathize with me and with other queer trans and, um, and drag artists as well that um, just because Tommy did it and just because Tommy opened that door to talk about um, doesn't mean that that is everybody's um, burden to do. Um, I also am somebody as an academic um, and as a leader in the university who wears my identity um, very publicly and very much on my sleeve. And that's how I do my work to be a leader in social justice um, kind of work for that. Um, it can be exhausting. Um, and it is not every individual diverse person's job to be teaching you and to be helping you unlearn. Um, you should ask if you can ask questions. That kind of double fronted, you know, would it be okay if I asked you a question? Um, and don't be, um, don't be surprised if they say no. Um, these are very personal things to talk about. Um, I have had the wonderfully kind of double-edged privilege of doing autoethnographic work where this has been a part of um, all of my training as an academic and all of my publishing and writing and teaching and everything. Um, 
but that's a little bizarre. Um, and again, some of you may have felt this slide and the amount of time that I'm taking on this slide, um, maybe it made you uncomfortable in some way. Um, and if it did, I'm actually kind of happy um, because I think discomfort is one of the best places for us to start learning. So this is a photo of my Pekingese Chihuahua, Sam. He often makes this really confused face when I wake him up from napping. So it's become my stock image for pausing and checking in with folks and saying, what can I clarify? Because you might be feeling like Sam right now since we've talked about language, grammar, pronouns, gender pronouns, pronoun series, the they them series, the, the Z here here series, the V them ver series, different terminology, drag, and anything else that you're thinking of. Um, so I do wanna pause here. And so I realize as well that um, please everyone take a moment to type, um, take a moment to think as well for that. Um, and I'll start seeing what's coming up and then we will move in just a moment um, to more conversations around the, the teaching and learning specifically. There's a great question everyone that asks, um, how are other cultures slash languages incorporating gender inclusivity into their language and communication? Um, and that's one of my favorite questions that I don't have a great answer to. Um, but the reason why I, um, I, I really wanna talk about this is that I have made it very much an English language presentation. You know, all the, the subheadings or all the headings of the slide say, you know, English, um, English pronouns, English language for that, um, because that is the, um, you know, the, the dominant language we're speaking in. It's also the one that I have had the most um, challenges with as an Anglophone speaker um, and the history and the, the colonizing history and the patriarchal Christian Catholic history as well from that. Um, but there are several other folks who are doing work in gender inclusivity in, in language as well. Um, an example that I know of that I would like to share is in... Um, in Spanish speaking cultures and, and Latinx, um, Latin American cultures as well. Um, they have a suffix system where they use the O ending to, to nouns and to verbs to signify a male um, binary, kind of like our, our he pronoun, um, or an A ending to like um, Chico or Chica. And what they've started doing is putting an X as the suffix to just completely cancel out and get rid of the O or the A, and they pronounce it. Um, so it used to be, um, the Latino or Latina community. And now to be more inclusive with gender and language and communication, it would be more appropriate to say the Latinx community um, to represent all types of bodies and identities because even Latina is not an inclusive um, word. And Latino, um, you know, kind of in, in our English language, how we have guys and people say, well, guys, I'm using gender neutrally. You are not using guys gender neutrally. You can't use guys gender neutrally. Um, I use girl gender neutrally, and I do that ironically because I'm very aware that girl is also not a gender neutral term, um, but it, it knocks people back a little bit when I call somebody who clearly is male identifying um, girl. Um, but you know that's what folks who don't identify as guys feel when, when they get referred to as guys. Um, there's a lot more French as our, in Canada as our um, second language. French has a, a different kind of um, challenge with the, the inclusive language because it's um, built more steadily into the, the nouns themselves. They don't have the suffix ending like Spanish does. Um, but that is, that's kind of the extent right now of the work and things I've done into that. My disciplinary background is English language and literature. Um, so that also tends to be where I teach and where I publish for that. But thank you for asking that question. Um, if anyone is looking for more resources on that, I have been collecting them over the years from folks who have, um, when they've heard my answer or my non-answer to that question, they've sort of sent me a lot of stuff to read. So I haven't built it into the, the keynote here because I do really want to um, focus specifically on um, English as a spoken and used language for that. Um, Another question here is, um, I'm familiar with LGBTQ2S+, but I've not heard the I and A included before. Can you please clarify what that represents? Um, absolutely. And this is important to our, <laughs> to our work as well when we get to cultures of respect. Um, the I stands for intersex, um, from intersexuality, which is the now um, acceptable, appropriate, inclusive term um, to use for um, 
babies who cannot be sexed, either male or female at birth, because their genitalia is ambiguous. Um, it's what we used to call very popularly hermaphroditism, um, but intersexuality is the clinical designation, and intersex is the, the community of folks who are um, assigned that third gender category at birth um, because the doctor can't sex them one way or the other. Um, it's really important to include the I, I think, um, when we do the initialism of the acronym, um, because there's a very different history, there's a very different contemporary with intersex communities and folks as well. And when we're thinking about gender pronouns, um, because of the way that the, the medical community treated their body when they were born, um, our language system never even um, fit or worked appropriately or acceptably for them. Um, and then the A um, largely stands for asexual, which would be a type of sexual orientation that is has a lot of different nuances around it. But um, asexual or asexuality, um, asex or ace, as um, folks in the community call them, um, tend to be people who experience sexual attraction differently than people who um, don't actually think about their their sexual attraction or fit in a kind of um, gay, lesbian, bi kind of um, identity there. Um, the A also can stand for ally or allies. Um, some folks are not happy. Some folks in the, the LGBTQIA2S plus community are not as happy with the allies for that because they want the space to be for them. Um, but I think especially in 2020 going forward, um, being an ally can be really challenging. Um, it can be really isolating. It can be really exclusive. And um, as we know from history, we can't change the world if the, the folks who are not marginalized aren't standing um, in front of, with, or beside us in the work that we're doing. Um, so I like to think of the A as including um, asexuals as well as um, allies. As I was talking, there was about 10 more questions that came, um, but I'm not going to read through them all now and answer those. Thank you so much folks for um, jotting those in. Uh, later today, I will, um, I will pop back onto Zoom and I will answer more of those so that we have those as well. Um, but thank you for those questions. I'm going to jump into the teaching and learning part um, and then we're gonna go through that and there will be another, um, another touch base as we get to the, to the wrapping up piece. So any questions that aren't um, answered already, I know I only got to two, um, but we will, we will keep chatting. Um, so thank you for the questions. So when we talk about gender pronouns in teaching, we're looking at fostering inclusivity in our teaching and we can foster inclusivity in our teaching with gender pronouns in two key ways. These are kind of two of the key takeaways that I want us to think about um, with our goal setting and kind of our action items for it. And the first is how we create and maintain an inviting space around us as teachers. And the second is by modeling. And I'm very aware that I'm sitting behind my computer right now and I'm not in front of you all on a grand stage in heels where I can actually demonstrate what I mean by modeling, by treating it as a catwalk. No, I'm kidding. That's not what I mean by modeling. Um, we'll talk about that in a moment, but that's a type of modeling that um, I think works very well in, the, in my classrooms. But with both of these, with creating and maintaining an inviting place around us as teachers and with modeling, we need to be intentional and meaningful. And we also need to be transparent. So for creating and maintaining a place around us, I wanna share this long quotation from Adrienne Rich, who was a hugely influential American poet and feminist in the, um, the sort of the modern period, the, the kind of the 1960s um, around there. And in some of her academic writing, she wrote that, when someone with the authority of a teacher describes the world and you are not in it, there is a moment of psychic disequilibrium, as if you looked into a mirror and saw nothing. Yet you know you exist and others like you, that this is a game with mirrors. It takes some strength of soul, and not just individual strength, but collective understanding, to resist this void, this non-being, into which you are thrust, and to stand up, demanding to be seen and heard. This quotation for me means a lot more right now in the, the current um, world we're living in with Black Lives Matter, with anti-Black um, racism, with so much of the, um, the, the powerful racial and social justice um, movements that we're going through right now. Um, but when I first came across this quotation, I, um, I felt that I was one of those learners in, in my classrooms where my teachers were describing the world and it, it wasn't me. It, I, you know, I felt like a vampire who was looking into a mirror and nothing was reflected back at me. And this quotation has stayed with me for a long time and I think um, will continue for, for a, a long time forward as well. Um, because in racial and social justice work as teachers, 
we have so much power. You know, Rich talks about it as authority, but it, it really is. It's more power th th than just that, that authority that we have for it because we are describing the world for our learners. And our learners, you know, as much as we grow older and, and as much as our research changes and research around us changes, our learners tend to stay 17 to 21 years old. Um, they change with generational shifts, but that tends to be the age group. And, and we really have this power where in our classrooms, we are describing the world. We are painting the picture of that world. And that picture we're painting is a mirror we're holding up to them. And it's our responsibility to paint that world and to hold that mirror in a way where every single one of our students doesn't feel that psychic disequilibrium, doesn't feel that they're thrust into that void of non-being where they have to stand up and demand to be seen and heard, where we can actually um, make sure that they are seeing and hearing themselves in it. And there are tons of ways beyond just the, the modeling of gender pronouns we're going to share. Um, I'm going to share today that we can do that. Um, but I want you to keep this quotation in mind as, as we're going through about what our students see the world to be like through the lens of who we are as teachers. Because um, as Dean Spade said, says, um, for students who use pronouns or names that do not match what a professor would assume to find on a roster, these forms of misidentification can make students unwilling to participate in class and can impact their learning. Um, so we know that there are registrarial challenges with rosters, with um, legal names, with, um, you know, binary gender markers that go into um, what creates who our students are as, you know, numbers instead of people as, as in our systems. Um, and Spade's talking about the way that this actually impacts our students' learning. And Spade takes it further by saying that being called by what you go by rather than being misgendered or misnamed actually reduces anxiety, depression, and suicidality. And those are hugely important pieces for us to be aware of as teachers as well. The suicidality piece should ring and sting with all of us as teachers across the academy as well with our students, because we know that this happens. We know that this happens so much and it's not reported and it, it's, it's traumatic and, and it's, it's terrifying that our, our system is such a powerful system that it actually can take lives. Um, and short of that, it is depressive and it causes anxiety. And being able to reduce that in our students um, seems like so much more than just a nice thing to be able to do or an added bonus to shifting our language. It seems like what we're actually called to be doing as teachers for sure. And Spade's talking about a way that um, using pronouns can begin that really hard work and can start those shifts. And just a note here, um, thinking about our conversations around other languages and cultures as well with pronouns, this works for much more than just gender identity and expression. Um, we know, especially in Canada, that we have a lot of international students who come into our classrooms and the names that show up on the rosters may not be the names that they use or identify with. They may not be names that we can pronounce. Um, there are so many other pieces too where um, students who have English as additional language, um, students who for any reason, you know, um, who had a last name from, um, a, a marriage or from um, an abusive family member or um, any number, any number of reasons um, could cause anxiety, depression and push towards suicidality in our students. So um, when we talk about modeling and we think around ways to do this, um, it's not just around the, the inclusivity and the social justice moves for cultures of respect with gender and sex identities. It relates to everything. Um, and you know, it's one of the key principles as well of um, universal design is it, it, it starts as a kind of retrofit, um, but if we're proactive in it, it actually is way more accessible and inclusive. Spade also says that with the exception of people in very small or very special pockets of liberal arts education, most trans and non-binary students and trans and non-binary young people face ongoing hostility and erasure and crave spaces where there's an invitation to be respectfully referred to. And I really like this, this language of crave spaces where there is an invitation to be respectfully referred to um, because I like asking people, how can I respectfully refer to you rather than asking what their pronoun is? Um, I do find that when I ask a lot of people outside the academy what their pronoun is and sometimes even inside the academy, they don't even know what I'm asking. Um, but to ask how I can respectfully refer to you is a little bit softer of a door to begin opening. Um, and what Spade's talking about here with our trans and non-binary students and other trans and non-binary young people, um, they want that space 
where there's an invitation to be respectfully referred to. So how do we begin to create and maintain these inviting spaces? Well, we can model our own pronouns and we can transparently invite our students to do so as well. So this is, this is what I meant when I had said um, creating and maintaining by, by modeling, um, is that we can create this space where we are showing what it looks like and we are openly, transparently asking our students to do so as well. I shouldn't say asking, excuse me, inviting them to do so as well. But thinking about digital remote teaching as well, um, one of the, the easiest ways to um, begin showing your students a lot of information and giving them a lot of ideas about who you are um, is the email signature. Um, so you'll see underneath all of that, my email signature is massive, um, but colorful. Um, underneath the, the St. Jerome's University logo, you'll see a hyperlink to pronouns, colon, and then my pronouns. Um, that hyperlink actually takes you to a gender pronouns and teaching tip sheet that I wrote when I was at the Center for Teaching Excellence at the University of Waterloo. Um, and I like that. I like to have that hyperlink there so that people can do a little bit more reading and research on their own for it. Um, but, you know, I also use this kind of like as prime real estate for stuff. So I have my note around letting people know that my working day may not be their working Day and that's okay. I have the several different roles and titles I have as you know my my career manager of outreach and recruitment. I'm also an instructional skills workshop trainer facilitator. I'm the interim vice chair of communications for the Educational Developers Caucus. You can find me on Facebook and Twitter. I have the my um, my acknowledgement of my white settler scholar identity, living and working on the traditional territory. So this tells our students a lot of us when they um, when we reach out to them or they reach out to us as well. Um, our syllabi basically puts all the information from our signature onto the first page of the courses as well. So under instructor information, you have your name, you have your office, you have your phone number, your extension, your office hours, your email, all things that people need to productively engage with you. They also need your pronouns. Um, so including your pronouns there has that on the syllabus, that contract of the, the course curriculum with you for the term. It also reminds you to say it out loud that first day of class, so you can actually speak it rather than just have it there kind of as, and all my important information is, is there for you. Um, again, I have the hyperlink there. I also have hyperlinks to the different building floor plans and accessibility um, guidelines because um, I've never been in an office that people could easily find. So I've also found that by linking to the university's um, floor plans that explains where the, the washrooms are, where the accessible entries are, um, can kind of help them um, navigate and, and go through that. But putting pronouns on your syllabus is also a great way to model it. Um, thinking again about um, where we're probably going to be teaching, um, we're probably going to be sharing a lot of stuff through email and on the learning management systems. But in Zoom, um, if you put as your first name, your first and last name, and if you put as your last name, your pronouns, um, it will show up in your Zoom account, as you can see with mine, it'll show up as your name and your pronouns there. Um, you also can, for, um, for your students, if you're not wanting them to be on camera, if they're not wanting to be on camera, um, we know there's a lot of work and research going on right now around um, looking into people's homes and understanding that asking your students to be on camera shows a lot of their um, home environment and their workspace and those sort of pieces as well. Um, you could have your students create Bitmojis and um, they can, the Bitmoji app actually lets you type in pronoun to search for a sticker that will bring up your Bitmoji smiling and pointing upward um, at a bunch of different pronoun series. Um, unfortunately, you can't customize it enough to be able to, for me to have put he, she, and they all together in them. Um, but you could, have, you could have your students do this or you could do it when you turn the camera off instead of bringing up your profile picture, it could be um, an, a Bitmoji avatar with the, um, the pronouns on that as well. And this is a, a tip that I got from um, my co-editor, Lindsay Bride, who does this with, um, with her students. And they have a lot of fun because some of them create avatars that don't even look like them. They just have fun creating an avatar for the course and having them, them not be on camera. Um, social media is another great way where you can put your pronouns there as well um, so that people who are engaging with you can see those. Um, we also know that our students tend to look us up as teachers and social media, if you're not on LinkedIn or if you don't have, um, you know, a rate my prof or something like that going, social media tends to come up for those as well. Um, and outside of teaching and learning, it's a great way to signal um, a lot of the, the cultures of respect as well. 
Because I started my job at St. Jerome's during the pandemic, I haven't yet got an office or business cards or anything. So I'm using the photo of my Waterloo ones and my Guelph ones. Um, but you can, I worked with Guelph and Waterloo to have um, the pronoun place added as an optional addition to the business cards. So you could have those there. When I started working at, at the University of Waterloo, the business cards were so important for my work with other um, faculty and um, grad students specifically to, to reach out. And I started realizing that the business card was, even before my email signature, the first place that they were seeing my name. And sometimes I'd leave a stack of them and they wouldn't even meet me. They would just grab the card. And so it was important to have those there. Um, it's an optional box and that's really important. Um, we shouldn't be forcing anybody to share or disclose um, the pronoun series or to have to choose um, or to fit into something. And I'll, I'll chat about that a little bit more. Um, but one day I'll have my St. Jerome's ones here. And then this one doesn't actually work for us in, in the pandemic, but for us, you know, um, being wish oriented and, and thinking to the future when we get back to our offices. Um, I like to use my door as um, prime real estate for everything queer and trans and everything about me. And so this is a picture of the, my door when I was at um, the Office of Teaching and Learning at Guelph. And you can't quite see it, but on the door wheel um, under my name here, I put my proper pronouns and I put the list there. So if students were, or anyone, were walking past my office, not only could they see and learn about a bunch of stuff that's happening, but when they were looking to find my contact info in other places, they'd also see how to respectfully refer to me. And then another, the last one that I want to share um, is um, working with your admin folks to update the... Um, the web bios at your institution or on your page in your department, um, kind of like the syllabus where it has all of your administrative information that people need to know about you. Um, pronouns are part of that. So job title, department, phone number, extension, email address, office, pronouns. Um, so at St. Jerome's, I've started working with Michelle Watson, who's our director of human resources, um, to start getting um, some of these updated as folks are wanting and are interested in that. This is also a place where, um, where students will find us and where students will look for us. And if they're seeing the pronouns, not only do they know how to respectfully refer to you as the, the teacher, but they also see that signal um, that you're open, that you're aware, that you're, um, uh, you know, hopefully um, through that, that you're somebody who is working toward creating a safer space of the, the classroom um, and your work. And so just a, a note reminder, each of these photos appears on their own slide at the end of the slideshow for your future reference as well. So when we think about modeling pronouns specifically, um, that's more than just what I was sharing with all the ways we can put our pronouns out there so they're, they're around it and signaling, but we can share our pronouns out loud the first day of class with our students and we can invite our um, students to share their pronouns too. And I did put an asterisk here and that's important because you could do this through a getting to know you questionnaire for any size class or for smaller classes, you could do a pronoun go round. And a pronoun go round is one of those introduction circles that we know all of our students hate, where you ask them to go around and say, you know, two things about themselves or something like that. And you could ask them to share their pronouns as well. Um, but in either case, doing a getting to know you questionnaire or doing a pronoun go round, there are procedural things to remember and keep in mind. And I won't go through all of them here. Dean Spade does a really great job in his article. We still need pronoun go rounds talking about them. But some of the key flags to think of and to keep thinking through with them are as a teacher, again, with that authority and power, if you tell your students, please share your name, your major and your pronouns, um, you might unintentionally out folks in, in class who now feel they have to share their pronoun and maybe they're not ready to share the one that is their lived pronoun. So then you're giving them um, a real challenge around lying or mispronouning themselves in order to feel safe by not having to share the lived pronoun. Um, there can be anxiety over languages, uh, over language, excuse me. As I said, sometimes when I ask people, um, what are their pronouns? People don't even know what a pronoun is because they haven't gone through those slides with me around the history of pronouns. Um, you know, so clearly explaining and situating pronouns for them, um, creating teachable moments around that, um, letting folks have an opt out, setting up kind of other expectations around the serious nature of this. Um, one of the most harmful things and one of the most disheartening things can be when um, straight and cisgender folks make a joke 
of the pronoun go round. I've heard people say they identify as a vegetable or they identify as Jennifer Aniston or they don't care what pronouns they use. Um, takes a lot of privilege to be able to not care what pronoun you use. Um, and those things can come out unintentionally in a pronoun go round if we haven't set it up properly. So I won't keep going into that, but the article from Dean Spade does a great job of that. Um, but having this conversation with your students as part of creating that space with them, as part of modeling um, how to use pronouns and what they are, is really that, that key first step towards setting up um, that culture of respect. Um, and it all comes back to intentionality and transparency. Um, it's not enough to just throw your pronouns on, um, on your business card and then not be ready to engage with it productively and safely with your students. So when we get to cultures of respect and we're talking about pronoun awareness, Spade says, which is kind of the thesis to this whole talk, um, that we can use pronoun awareness as a way to signal a culture of respect. If we explain the exercise to folks clearly, it will do the job we want it to and make group spaces easier for people to participate in and build skills in each of us to make less assumptions about each other. Another story that I wanna share here, going back to that slide with the, the oversharing of information about me um, is I am often, although increasingly not the first, but I'm often the first person in an intro circle um, to share my pronouns. And I'm as comfortable as I am as, as a queer and trans person, as an academic drag queen, um, Sometimes the space I'm in is not a teaching and learning space. Sometimes it is not a space where um, I feel like it is my job to be teaching and training around this. Sometimes I'm there, you know, as a representative of a different group or something. Um, but when I'm the first person to share my pronouns, um, I even still sometimes feel embarrassed or I feel like I'm outing myself or I feel like I am... Um, oversharing, and I start to feel all of those really um, anxious things that I shouldn't be feeling. Um, and on the flip side of that, when I'm in a, a group space and we are doing an intro circle and someone else shares their pronouns before me, it, it, it's like flipping on a light switch. It just completely changes the way that I'm feeling about engaging in that space because I now can follow suit rather than being potentially that token queer or trans person who has different pronouns. So thinking about, um, you know, building skills in each of us to make less assumptions about each other is really important too, because um, we are teachers for our students, but we're also learners. Um, you know, one of the themes of, of this talk was unlearning and thinking about unlearning. Um, assumptions are things we have to um, unlearn as well. Um, so for us, even if we're not in a teaching and learning space, um, being aware of sharing our pronouns in intro circles can start to change um, cultures as well. Jack Halberstam um, says that I wish, or he wishes, um, that more people would behave like my partner's son and simply ask politely and without judgment what pronoun an, an individual prefers. And Jack also says that he wishes more people would use a pronoun system based on gender and not on sex, based on comfort rather than biology, based on the presumption that there are many gendered bodies in the world and male and female do not even begin the hard work of classifying them. And I really like these quotations from Jack because they add so much more to um, that culture of respect around politely and without judgment, asking what, in, what pronouns an individual refers to. And also thinking about changing that pronoun system or starting to change that pronoun system to one based on gender and not on sex. Something not based on biology or anatomy or different presumptions because there are so many more gendered bodies than just male gendered and female gendered. And our English language, again, thinking about English language specifically, has two pronouns that for, you know, over 300 years, or, sorry, not over, coming up on 300 years, um, have caused so much damage um, around the way that we understand um, who people are. With, with, the, with those two, um, and it shouldn't have. As we saw from the Wycliffe Bible and as we saw from the 1300s, um, there was another pronoun there that didn't have to be as damaging or as restricting for that. Pronouns are also starting to show up in popular and public cultures. Um, so Lady Gaga, um, last year in June 2019 at the Apollo Theater, um, set up a off-the-cuff preface to her song, Million Reasons, by saying, quote, I wish to share this with anyone who is listening not just in this theater, but around the world. Ask the question, what is your pronoun? 
Because for a lot of people, it's really hard and their pronoun is not respected or they're not asked. And for me, I've grown and changed over the years in a lot of different ways. I felt misunderstood in a lot of different ways. All of our hardships are different. I don't mean to compare. I just mean to say we're in this together and I've had a million reasons to want to give up. But sometimes, if you're lucky, you just need one good reason to stick around. And it was this moment that um, I first actually saw in HuffPost when I read the article, but there are some cool videos of it as well. It was this moment where Lady Gaga, who um, perhaps now with her Chromatica album being released, is becoming a little bit more back on top of the, um, as somebody who's a leader in the LGBTQA 2S plus community. Um, but Lady Gaga is an openly bisexual person who also is um, part of the, the drag community with her drag king persona, Joe Calderoni as well. You know, she's accepted awards in drag. She's performed in music videos and in concerts in drag as well. So she's somebody who for a lot of people has been and still is um, a popular kind of pedagogue in this way. Um, and so for her to say to a theater full of people, ask the question, what is your pronoun in 2019, was just a wonderful moment of seeing this work, um, you know, being taken out of the academy, being taken out and, you know, starting really to shift those cultures of respect. Um, and to wrap up, I want to end on a very, um, a very serious, and I hope not too somber note for this, but um, a serious and even, um, even more so today, um, important and even deadly note to end on um, about how careful we need to be in this work. Um, it's not enough to just be caring. It's not enough to just have good intentions or goodwill The impacts are even more important than the intentions. Um, and so these are things that we have to continue to think about, such as the medicalization of queer bodies and trans bodies and intersex bodies. Um, when, they, when the word homosexuality and the word transsexuality came about, they came about as medical diagnoses that were um, illnesses that needed to be cured needed to be fixed, needed to be taken away. Um, and, you know, now these are identities that still aren't wholly celebrated, um, you know, still are considered, um, and, you know, a lot of the rhetoric um, considered to be medicalized bodies or bodies with pathologies or bodies with, um, you know, going back to like the Catholic church, um, bodies of sin and stuff as well. And so thinking about those histories as well, we have to be careful. Um, we also have to be careful around trauma and re-traumatization. Um, thinking about microaggressions, but also thinking about laziness um, in the classroom with our students. We don't know our students' histories. We don't know the histories and the stories of people that we're coming across. And mispronouning um, to us might be a simple, oops, excuse me, I meant, and using another pronoun. Um, but it could be an incredibly traumatizing or re-traumatizing moment for somebody um, who hasn't um, been referred to in that way. That was just a, a good intentioned mistake on that part. Um, so Laverne Cox, who is a uh, black trans woman, a trans activist, an actress, a leader, um, um, a, a social activist, racial activist um, in, now I can't even do my math, but six years ago, um, she had said, where are we as an LGBT community over 45 years after the Stonewall Rebellion? Sylvia Rivera warned us about becoming a movement that was only for middle-class white people. And 45 years later, the most marginalized of our community are still struggling. And so I've updated the, the image a little bit to say, you know, it is now actually um, 51 years later. Uh, June 28, 1969 was the, the Stonewall riot. Um, so last year, actually, um, June 28, 2019, was the 50th anniversary of the Stonewall riot, which for those of us who um, don't know or don't remember what the Stonewall riot is, is it was in New York in 1969 at a, um, a queer and trans club um, that was predominantly... Um, for homeless, marginalized, um, Latinx folk, trans folk, um, black folk who were there in as a, a early um, kind of drag bar even. And Marsha P. Johnson and Sylvia Rivera, um, one night when the cops were coming in to, to raid the bar on the night of June 28th, um, they had been fed up with how over-policed um, bodies of color are and queer bodies and trans bodies. And um, Sylvia threw a bottle at the cops and Marsha threw a brick and it ignited this massive um, rebellion in the Stonewall Inn, which was the club. And the next morning on June 29th, 1969, they all marched down to the precinct um, to 
basically, um, you know, demand respect and, and demand for the, um, the policing to stop. Um, and that was the first Pride Parade. And Laverne's right, you know, speaking six years ago, when you look at, you know, Toronto Pride, for example, um, you see how white it is, you see how middle class it is, you see how affluent it is. Um, even the drag queens um, who would be in there don't tend to be um, drag queens of color um, or trans drag queens um, at all. It, it has, as, um, as Laverne Cox is talking here, um, it's largely become a movement only for white middle class people. And so thinking about our work with gender pronouns and teaching as well, we have to be aware of and reflect on whiteness and marginalization and struggle um, because we haven't made it. Um, white middle class people have made it. Um, and, you know, as a white settler scholar, academic drag queen who is queer and trans, um, I understand that there is a ton of privilege in my body and my identity. Um, so my work is really, really wanting to focus on it, as I said, as we wrap up here, um, that we have to pay attention to the impacts of our work. Um, we can't let good intentions absolve us of the impacts that come out of it. So this is a photograph of the flagpole at St. Jerome's University, um, and it is flying the Canadian flag, the flag of Ontario, and the Progress fly, Pride flag. So this past June um, in 2020, for the, the first time, St. Jerome's University has flown a version of the Pride flag, and it's not the six bar banner um, pride flag that is the traditional or historical one. It's the progress pride flag, which in this picture you can see on the left hand side of the flag has um, triangular arrow marks pointing forward or pointing to the right metaphorically forward that include um, white, um, powder pink and baby blue which those three colors are of the trans pride flag. And you can't quite see it in this photo but on the outer side of the, the baby blue triangle um, is a brown um, triangle and then a black triangle, which are the bars of the BIPOC flag, the Black, Indigenous and People of Color pride flag. Um, so the Progress pride flag is, is incorporating trans and non-binary as well as BIPOC identities into the flag with those arrows pointing um, forward at the future and signaling that growth that we have to, we have to work toward. Um, and so this was a big moment for us at St. Jerome's. It was the first time in our history that we had flown any version of the pride flag, but we also knew that it needed to be the one that would be the most racially and socially just um, going forward, the progress pride flag. So thinking about our symbolism as well, thinking about um, which symbols we're using, how we're using the symbols, how we're wanting those to signal cultures of respect and signal safer spaces and braver spaces and positive spaces and places on campus. And so with that, I want to thank you and I want to move to open up the Q&A and I want to move to um, three pictures of Sam because you had seen Sam before and his what can I clarify face. So I'm thinking at this point, as we're wrapping up, um, you might be feeling like one of these Sams. So you might be the Sam on the left um, where maybe you're coming up for air at this point, you know, coming out from under the, under the blanket or under the sweater or the hoodie or something, you're thinking, okay, um, I'm coming up for breath of air. You know, I got this, I'm ready. Or maybe you're Sam in the middle. Maybe you're feeling alert and still curious about all of the goings on. Or maybe you're Sam on the, the right side and you've got your bow tie on, you are dressed to the nines, you are ready to go. Um, whichever Sam you are, I'm, I'm excited for conversation and for getting into Q&A with you folks. And I thank you again. Just one reminder, in the PDF of the slides includes my work cited, as well as the modeling pronoun photographs, photographs um, individually. So you can see each of those ones as well. Um, so thank you one more time for having me as your speaker at the, the Online Teaching Institute with the Center for Teaching and Learning at the University of Alberta. Um, and I can't wait to keep chatting and engaging with you all. Um, so I just wanted to say thank you so much. This has been so incredible. This is something that um, the U of A uh, has really needed for a long time is to have these open conversations around pronoun use, around cultures of respect. Um, and, you know, this act of unlearning, you know, we're, we're all in different stages of this, you know, along a very uh, wide spectrum. I'm just thinking about the work that I do uh, with Indigenous uh, worldviews and epistemologies. Um, but, you know, what really stands out for me is how open and honest you are about who you are in the world and in the world of academia. And I know that your keynote today will probably resonate for a long time with the individuals who participated in this today. So thank you so very much. Um, and you know, we are, we are so grateful for you. Thank you. Thank you so much.
Thank you for having me, everyone.